All right, hi everybody. My name is Brennan Beam. I'm a hydraulic engineer at HEC. Uh, hydraulics are really my jam, but I've spent a lot of time with LifeSim. Uh, I work on the HEC FDA. Uh, that's kind of my spot. I'm a good resource. I'm very chatty if you ever have questions about this area. Uh, in this lecture, uh, my goal is not to make hydraulic engineers out of anybody, um, but I want to kind of smooth the conversation between new economists and consequence folks with hydraulic engineers uh, and maybe talk a little bit to hydraulic engineers about how to make that conversation go nicely too. Uh, we're going to start off with just what's important. So we build a hydraulic model that whose results get used in life sense. Um, so I want to talk about where those results get used. You probably saw a little bit of it from Woody's presentation, uh, but I'm going to be a little more explicit. Uh, then we're going to move into what I call the hydraulic vocabulary portion of the lecture. Uh, there, I want to give non-hydraulic engineers the language you need to speak to hydraulic engineers. Or hydraulic engineers are going to use words and terms that Uh, finally, I'm going to talk kind of specifics about what data you need. The LifeSim can take hydraulics in lots of different formats. Uh, and I want to touch on that. And then we're going to talk kind of a little more in the weeds of hydraulic modeling. Things you can, decisions hydraulic modelers can make to make the LifeSim modeler's experience more pleasant. So, starting with what's important. Uh, you can get lots of information out of a hydraulic model. These are the things that you actually care about, though. You want depths, velocities, arrival times, and duration if you are worrying about agriculture. I'm not going to talk much about agriculture. Uh, the first three are really what we're going to focus on. Those are huge. And they're huge because they get used in all the functions in life sim. These are straight out of the UI. Um, stability criteria, functions of depth and velocity, big hydraulic variables. Um, also, uh, for economic damage, uh, the structural depth hydraulic variables showing up there. So, to inform those functions, we build the RAS model and hand it over to LifeSim. Moving on to hydraulic vocabulary. Uh, these are the four words I decided were most important that people understand. Because um, they get talked about when you're, you're scoping a study uh, for LifeSim. Uh, there might be existing models that fit these descriptions. Um, and you're going to have to help decide, is that appropriate? Is that not appropriate? Do we need more? Do we need less? Um, so let's get right into it. We're going to talk first about steady versus unsteady models. So these are types of hydraulic models. This is a way of approaching the problem of getting depths uh, out of flow data. Um, steady state hydraulic modeling answers the question, what would our system look like if the flow was this? It's looking at a river and saying, if it was flowing at 1,000 CFS, what is, uh, how high is it going to get? Uh, it's the simplest way to approach a problem. Uh, they're wicked fast models. Uh, there's a lot of them in existence because for a while this was the way to model hydraulics. Um, these aren't what you want though. Uh, there is no sense of timing with this approach. I've got this GIF going up here uh, where it's kind of clicking through different profiles where I've, I've built a model and set the flow to different values. Uh, the hydrograph is over there on the right. Uh, and the time scale here is just infinity to infinity. There's no, there's no sense of time. We're not watching the river rise and fall, so we don't have any shot at getting the arrival time of the flood. We have no sense of timing with steady state models. And that's what I want you to latch on to. Steady state's probably going to be inappropriate because steady state means we're not considering time in our hydraulic modeling. Unsteady, just the opposite. One point, it is timing. The hydrograph here rises and falls like we imagine floods do. Um, you can see the animation here much prettier. That looks like how rivers flow if it was to flood and overtop that levee there. 
And we can see it move across. You can imagine there's lots of little houses in there that are um, getting their roads flooded and uh, washed away or whatever things are happening in this particular scenario. But that is unsteady hydraulics. Moving on, so steady, unsteady. Timing is the important key there. Now 1D and 2D. Uh, 2D hydraulics have gotten really uh, exciting in the last five years. People talk about it a lot, so you're going to hear that word a lot. Um, we're going to talk first about 1D. 2D is cooler, um, but hang with me for 1D for a minute, because uh, 1D has its place. Uh, the 1D is one dimension. In that dimension, along the streamline, um, mostly downstream. Water flows from high to low downstream. Uh, we have our key nodule, module, our key node that we are transferring water from is the cross section. The cross section is these little green lines. We are calculating uh, differences in water surface between these lines. When we draw a cross section as a hydraulic modeler, we are asserting that the water surface is flat across that line. So uh, if we look at these lines in the middle here, where the water is nicely constrained in the bank, that's like a that's pretty good assertion. Like you can imagine standing on the side of a river looking from bank to bank, the water's basically flat along that line. Uh, we can make that assertion pretty well. Uh, we're also asserting that the water is flowing perpendicular to it. Again, that's really nice in the channel. You know, we can imagine drawing a line perpendicular to the water that's flat across from bank to bank. Um, that is especially tricky in areas where we have a levee. Because when the river floods, it's hard to make the assertion that the water is the same elevation on the river side of the levee as it is on the land side. You're going to expect there's some difference there. Also, water in levied areas can go all over the place. It's not just going in one direction. It's hard to draw a cross section to accommodate that. Um, in one dimensional modeling, the way we accommodate that is the storage area. Uh, that's this kind of blue outlined area here. Uh, the storage area is cool. It is just calculating how much volume overtops the levee and gets in that area and then filling it up like a bathtub. There's something beautifully simplistic about that. Uh, it's rough though. We're interested in timings. Um, so if we're filling it up from the bottom, uh, we could potentially be teleporting water, which is what's happening in this case. In this model, it's actually overtopping here at the top. That's where water is getting into that storage area, but we're filling from the bottom. So water is kind of teleporting across this study area. Um, there's a bunch of arrival times and things we're missing in here. So storage area is a bane of existence for a Lifeson modeler. Probably not appropriate in most cases. Uh, storage areas, also since they're just filling from the bottom, no knowledge of velocity. We're not seeing water move around there, we're just filling the tub. 2D hydraulics is the answer. 2D hydraulics, way cool. We like this. We lay out a grid and we let water move from cell to cell. Um, it can go wherever it wants. Uh, the uh, animation over here is of Glendive, Montana. You can imagine in the river here, you can, I, 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 I won't say you could, I can imagine. I'm perpendicular to flow and the flow is uh, flat across it. But once we get up into this area, there's a levee, and you can see from the particle tracers, water is like kind of spiraling around this thing. That would be tricky with cross sections. We could use a storage area, but then we lose velocity, and we could be teleporting water in weird ways. So we don't really want to do that. 2D is the, is the answer for this, this area. It's the, it's the best solution. Um, a good question is why don't we just always do this? Because this is way better. And uh, the secret is it's also an easier way to model. Um, it's typically quicker for a modeler to spin up a model like this. Um, it is computationally slower. This is a way more sophisticated way to approach the problem, which can make it, it might mean that the modeler takes longer to iterate as they're building it, which can extend the, the construction time. Also, if you have a big model, your compute times can, can get as wild as you wish them to. Uh, you can really go overboard with this. Now, you're also terrain data hungry. So you need to know what the land looks like under each of these cells. 
Whereas with the 1D model, you only need to know what the land looks like under the cross section. And that's it. That's the hydraulic primer here. Um, we've got steady flow and unsteady flow. The big difference is timing. That's what I want you to latch on to. Uh, between 1D and 2D, just know that 1D is along the channel. Um, 2D lets it move wherever it wants. Um, so just a little, little question here. Uh, can, you, can you mash these words together enough to say what types of models will we want for life safety? For life safety, are you going to want a steady or an unsteady model? Unsteady is right. That's easy. Um, 1D or 2D? That's right. Uh, you could have, I, like I pointed out earlier, in the banks, or with, yeah, within the banks of the river, 1D is actually Oh, cool. That's the end of the vocabulary. Uh, we're going to move on to some more practical stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about what we need from, from a RAS model or from a hydraulic model. Uh, you can put in lots of different formats of hydraulic data. Woody has been incredibly accommodating uh, to different hydraulic models. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the representative hydrograph and how hydraulics plays into the timelines that Woody was talking about in the first lecture. Uh, and then going to kind of address a, a common problem. Uh, a lot of times you're going to use RAS as your hydraulic model. At least that's what I see the most often. Um, so there's a couple gotchas that happen enough that I wanted to slip them into a lecture, even if it's not super clean. So like I said, Woody, super accommodating to different types of models. I like RAS. I'm comfortable with RAS. I think you should always use RAS. That's not true. There's times where you can't. And if you have to use one of these other uh, models, For the workshops today, you're going to be using RAS. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on here, but I wanted to, uh, for folks who are interested in that, we can definitely talk uh, offline about it. Yeah. Can you supply the tools for life safety and functional measurement? You would be sacrificing that uh, that resolution. Yeah. If you if you're not using velocity then you won't have stability criteria being evaluated. You could, but you're making your, you're incrementally decreasing your confidence in your results. So whatever method you use to bring it in, um, you'll have some sort of uh, representative hydrograph you'll want to define. Uh, and most importantly, you're going to want to set the hazard occurrence time. That whole it's gonna fail. How much after the dam breaks did they um, decide it was time to evacuate? Um, so to, to have that relative time, you want your anchor point. Uh, so the hazard occurrence time uh, gets set off of a representative hydrograph. This one is pulled from right below a dam, so you see it spike way up. Um, so that is the moment the dam breaches, uh, and everything else in that timeline is kind of relative to this point. Like I said, you're going to be using HEC RAS for these workshops. Uh, I really like RAS. It's a really nice to use in LifeSim. They share a library that lets you bring in the files um, quite easily. Uh, RAS will walk you through a lot of things. The, the UI will let you define that hydrograph. Um, what you'll need from RAS is a, uh, is a plan file or a, a results file um, for the plan you're wanting to run and also the terrain data. The terrain data is really the gotcha. Oh, sorry. What's up? The first time step is arbitrary. We're looking, the important piece here is where the red line is. This is where the hazard has occurred.
So the gotcha with using RAS data is really nice to bring in, but a lot of the times, if you're talking to a hydraulic engineer, you might say, I need the terrain file. Um, but terrain files are like shape files. Like you, if you say you want a shape file of something, really you want like four files because uh, they have multiple pieces. And that's the same with RAS terrains. Uh, when I'm building a RAS terrain, uh, I take some number of source files, I import them into RAS, and Alex Kennedy does some really cool stuff to compress them and glue them together, and it comes out with multiple files, uh, each with a prefix of whatever you named the terrain. In this case, I called it terrain. Um, you'll have an HDF, some number of TIFFs, and a VRT. Uh, focus here, you need to bring it all around. You need to bring all of that. In the selector, you're only gonna select the HDF file, but these need to be next to it. Um, a lot of the times people just send that HDF, you'll get an error. Uh, make sure you bring the whole caboodle. Um, another little trick, RAS results are named the same as their plan files, just with an HDF at the end. Uh, it's really easy to grab the wrong one. If you're trying to grab the results for plan one, you might just grab the PO1 file, that's wrong. You want the PO1.HDF. Um, it's a much bigger file, that's a good tell. Um, but just an easy, easy thing to miss. And that's this section. That's all I want to get across. Uh, lots of ways to import data. Uh, the representative hydrograph uh, is where you're going to set a hazard occurrence time. That's important because the rest of your timeline is kind of anchored on that point. It's all relative to that. Um, and finally, bring along all those terrain files. You'll save yourself a headache. This is the end of the lecture. These are the last few points I want to hit. Uncertainty. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about file sizes. Um, and then finally, uh, the mapping interval that you can set in RAS. So for hydraulic modelers, that'll be a little more interesting than for others. They're kind of a, a RAS modeling decision rather than a life sim modeling decision. Um, but it's worth talking about. So life sim is neat because you can capture your uncertainty and all these parameters by not saying, I know the hazard is going to come out an hour before quantify that. There's also other tools you could use um, to incorporate them all together uh, that you might be interested in, uh, in exploring. But the important thing I want you to take away is that all your results are conditional on the hydraulic scenario you use to develop them. Uh, maybe one last piece before I leave this slide. Um, there's lots of things that are uncertain about hydraulic models. Uh, one big one to point out, um, how the dam breaches is pretty important, uh, especially if the people are pretty close to the dam, uh, how quickly that hole forms um, and how big that hole gets makes a big difference on what the hydraulics look like right downstream and can make a big difference on life loss. Um, so it is worth sensitivity testing that, um, if not accounting for it more sophisticated um, file sizes. 2D modeling, especially because I just told you you need to run multiple uh, multiple different scenarios with 2D models because they're better. Uh, your file sizes can get out of control. This is my computer. It is a picture of my file explorer when I was working on Whittier Narrows, which Whittier already talked about. I had 144 gigabytes in a folder just full of RAS results and terrain. Uh, that was rough. Like it was. It worked. Um, we did the best we could. I didn't we did a bad job. Um, but it did make, brought morale down a little bit when I had to wait overnight to get things from the engineer. And uh. So I wanted to dug in a little bit to kind of quantify where that space was coming from. Um, your terrain is big. Uh, that takes up data. Um, the things you can do to Minimize how much space you're taking up to make file trans. That I see, uh, horrible is ex exaggerating a bit, but um, RAS does that stitching together of source materials I talked about. That's why there's multiple files when you bring along the terrain. Um, some folks prefer to just make it all into one terrain. Um, they'll stitch it together in ArcMap instead, make one file, and send that as the terrain. That's fine, except if you have really nice, fine data, 
in one area of your model and really coarse 10 meter DEM elsewhere, it's all going to get resampled to the same. So your file size is going to shoot up more than the source data when you do something like that. And that can be unnecessarily annoying. So if you're a hydraulic engineer, use RAS to stitch together your things. They've done a super good job uh, at making terrains. Um, the other big source of data is the output file. You have lots of results. The size of that output file is going to be based on how many cells you have in your model um, and how much data you save from it, which comes from uh, your mapping output time step. So that's this guy right here for RAS modelers. Uh, RAS is going to compute a water surface elevation at every node in your model uh, at your computation interval. Here I've got it set to 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds, it's going to compute a water surface elevation and a velocity at every node. You don't have to save all of them, though. You have this mapping output interval that decides how many of those are you actually going to save to disk. The others are just going to get used in memory and thrown away. Um, so if I'm at 30 seconds and I save at a 30 second time interval, I get all my data. If I do a one minute mapping interval with a 30 second computation interval, I'm saving half of it. So I've half my file size. Um, that's pretty useful. Here, just a quick uh, series of videos I made. This is Kelly Barnes. Uh, the output file size is 50 megabytes uh, for this particular run. Uh, so I'm saving quite a bit of data uh, at a one minute time step. And that's what we see. This is great. That was a really nice animation. We have all the things we want. Uh, really, the things we want uh, is the, uh, the peak depth and the peak velocity at all of our structures. We want to make sure that data is saved to disk. If we go a little coarser, this next one's 15 minute, so I'm saving way less data. Uh, I'm down to 11 megabytes. This is already a pretty small model, but uh, you know, percentage-wise, um, if you had a big model, this could be a huge difference in data saved. Uh, my animation, not quite as good. Uh, it's a little bit coarser. I'm less excited about that. Um, going even more 30 minute. Now that looked, I'm not really confident we captured all the things we needed to capture. So there's a balance, but there's a knob you can turn as a hydraulic modeler and you can watch that in RAS and you want to make sure that what you hand over gives enough information, but no more uh, than you actually need. You want to be responsible with your file sizes. So that ends all that. I've talked about all the things I want to talk about. Uh, we'll check on learning here. Uh, if you're scoping a study to evaluate life loss in Sacramento, um, which of these describe what you want? Uh, do you want steady state 1D, unsteady 1D with, I'm not going to read these, A, B, C, or D. Somebody give me, throw me out a letter. C? I would say C or D seem pretty reasonable to me. B gets a little more dangerous with the storage areas. Storage areas, we missed that velocity component. Maybe we could get away with that in the agricultural areas upstream. Maybe we don't care so much over there. Uh, but we kind of are interested in the velocity of water. So I would say C or D, uh, both solid answers. And then, which of the following is true? You want to just call out a letter again? That's right. We don't consider hydraulic uncertainty in a single life sim simulation. It doesn't mean you can't explore it, but you have to do multiple runs to do so.